الحمد لله وحده الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا We continue with the tafsir of Shaykh Abdul Rahman bin Nasr al-Sa'adi rahimahullah ta'ala in Surah Al-Ankabut. He says about the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ Do those who perform sinful deeds Imagine or believe that they will be able to escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sa'a ma yahkumun. How evil is that which they have judged? We mentioned that the subject matter of this tremendous chapter in the Quran is al ibtila wal intihan. Is how everyone is tried and everyone is tested, whether they are a believer or whether they are a disbeliever, or whether they are an upright person, or whether they are a negligent and sinful person. Everyone is tried and everyone is tested. And Allah mentioned that He would not leave the people alone to merely claim that they believe without testing them in order to distinguish the sadiq from the kathib, the person who is true and genuine in their belief and the person who is disingenuous in their faith and how this trueness or a weakness thereof or a lack thereof is on many different levels is on many different levels and so according to the trueness of a person's faith will be his implementation of his faith and the strength of his faith and that which is demonstrated by his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the connection between the strength of a person's belief and his actions is something that is abundantly clear. It's something that is abundantly clear. The Khalifa, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Rahimullah Ta'ala, they said that he said, before descending from the minbar, in the last khutbah that he ever gave in his life while he was a Khalifa, the following words to his people. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is ma'adud min tabaqa awakhir tabi'in and he's sirar tabi'in and he is counted in the level, the generational level of the lesser tabi'in which is the second generation of Islam at the end of that generation. And he was so righteous that some of the people in his time thought that perhaps he may be the Mahdi. And the scholars have written extensively entire books, lengthy books about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And this is not the time for the details of that. But to show you the weightiness of this statement and the person who made the statement. He said, may Allah have mercy upon him. Ayyuhan nas, O people, imma annakum musaddiquna bil akhira wa hadha amalukum faantum hamqa. وَإِمَّا أَنَّكُمْ مُكَذِّبُونَ فَأَنْتُمْ حَلْكَاءَ وَالسَّلَامُ O people, either you really believe in the hereafter, but you still act like this, and so you are hamqa, and so you are, and so you are idiots. Or either you disbelieve in the hereafter, فَأَنْتُمْ حَلْكَاءَ And in that case, you're just destroyed, because you're disbelievers. Either you believe in the hereafter, but you still act like this, فَأَنْتُمْ Hamqa is a plural of ahmaq, like voluntarily retarded. You are hamqa. You are an idiot, an imbecile, voluntarily. You have betrayed the intellect. As Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said in one of his writings that it is from the way of Allah wa ta'ala with his creation. Concerning their intelligence, that whoever betrays Allah with their mind and tries to and he find ways away from what he is supposed to be doing in his religion, so on and so forth, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take his mind from him. He will take his intelligence from him. For either you truly believe in the hereafter, yet you still act like this, فَأَنْتُمْ hamqa. 
And so you must be idiots, you must be foolish. Or either you don't believe and so you are destroyed. And there are many narrations from the Salaf that should cause a person to introspect and to think deep, deeply about his situation and the connection between the genuineness of his faith and his actions. The genuineness of his faith and his actions. It doesn't mean that a sinful person doesn't love Allah and doesn't respect Allah and venerate Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. They just don't respect Allah and love Allah to the level that is obligatory, to the level that is mandatory. And he wants some of the companions reviled a man who kept getting flogged during the life of the Prophet ﷺ for drinking alcohol. And they reviled him. They made dua against him. The Prophet ﷺ, he attested that he was a man who loves Allah and his messenger ﷺ. Don't help the shaitan over your brother. Indeed, he is a man who loves Allah and his messenger ﷺ. Showing us what? That a man can be sinful. And still love Allah and the Messenger He can respect Allah, respect the boundaries of Allah Taala. He just doesn't respect Allah enough. He just doesn't respect Allah enough. And so the sidq, and the level of a person's belief and the effect that it has had upon him, it varies tremendously. This genuineness and the lack of genuineness, the strength of his genuineness, the weakness of his genuineness, this varies tremendously between person to person. And so Shaykh Asadi rahimullah ta'ala he says about this next verse Am Hasiba Ladina Yamaluna Sayyat and Yasbiquna Sa Amayah Kumun. And there's a person who does a sayyat and he who does a sayyat, Yani sins, who acts upon sin and disobedience, imagine that he could escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does he imagine that he can escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How evil is that which he judges? How evil is that which he judges? A ahasib aladina hemmuhum fi'lu sayyat, wurtikabul jinayat, and amaluhum satuhman. This is a tremendous admonition for every human being, Muslim or non Muslim. Sayyat are on many different levels, variations of severity, but a person should not make light of any of it or anything that Allah has revealed. There's a person who has the ambition and the aspiration to do a sayyat. To do acts of sin and disobedience, and to commit crimes and offenses. Does he imagine that Do they imagine that their actions will be forgotten and ignored by Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah will be heedless of what they have done. And this is why they are doing what they are doing. We just heard that in the last lesson. And that you think it to be hayyinan. Those that came with the if, you think it to be. And he's something light, but it is alim with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this re-emphasizes the point. This re-emphasizes the point that is made frequently throughout the Qur'an. And he does a person think that he can escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is heedless of what he has done, that Allah cannot catch him, that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala cannot catch him, that he's going to escape Allah's knowledge and his power. How many times is it mentioned in the Qur'an? وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُعْجِزِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Allah informs that you cannot outstrip Allah, you cannot escape Allah in the heavens nor in the earth. There's no way that you can get away from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Ain al-mafar wal ilahu talib wa dalimu maghrubu laysa al-ghalib where you run and Allah is pursuing you. And the oppressor is the one who is defeated and is never a victor. Even if he has a pyrrhic victory and thinks by oppressing another and he will get a temporary enjoyment in this world or a temporary victory in this world, Allah will catch him. Allah will catch him. So every person, Muslim or non-Muslim, should think about this verse. Even these verses that apply to the disbelievers more than they apply to the Muslims. How many times do we find in the example of the companions, with one Allah alayhim, and the example of the tabi'een in the early generations of Islam, that they would read over and over and over again verses that are mentioned about Allah tormenting the disbelievers on the day of judgment while weeping and crying. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, talking about those who oppress their souls. And first and foremost, the greatest oppression is shirkun billahi tabarak wa ta'ala and how Allah will deal first and foremost with the disbelievers on the day of judgment. Yet they read these verses over and over again and they apply them to themselves fearing the punishment of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do they think that Allah is heedless of them? Or that they can get away from Him? And that is why 
they have proceeded in the course of behavior that they have proceeded upon. And they found it easy to do these actions. How evil is that which they judge? Meaning that their judgment is an evil judgment. It is an oppressive, transgressing judgment, an opinion. Because it contains the following things. It contains the following things. If a person really thinks that he can escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no doubt that that's kufr. There's no doubt if a person thinks that he's really going to escape Allah, or that Allah doesn't know that he can escape Allah's knowledge or His power, there's no doubt that that's kufr. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, when He spoke about how the limbs of the people will bear witness against them on the Day of Judgment, He said, وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَتِرُونَ أَيَشْهَرَ عَلَيْكُمْ سَمْعُكُمْ وَلَا أَبْصَارُكُمْ وَلَا جُلُودُكُمْ You weren't hidden from Allah, such as that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala need to bring your hearing and your sight and your skins and your body, your limbs as a witness, as witnesses against you. وَلَكِنْ ظَنَنْتُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَعْلَمُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ وَذَلِكُمْ ظَنُّكُمْ الَّذِي ظَنَنْتُمْ بِرَبِّكُمْ أَرْدَاكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ But you used to imagine and believe that Allah didn't know much of what you used to do. Meaning that the Kufa in general, they had a belief about Allah and His existence, and that He had knowledge. But his knowledge of the juziyat, any of the intricate detail affairs, was something they didn't have a belief about. They disbelieved that Allah had detailed knowledge of everything. And so they imagined, for example, that they could come together and conspire against the Messenger wasallam and against the Muslims. And so long as they whispered amongst themselves, that Allah wouldn't hear them. And so long as they huddled together and tucked their heads and spoke low, that they could hide themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person has to ask himself, when he finds himself taking sin and disobedience lightly, he has to ask himself this question. And do you think that you're going to get away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can you escape Allah's knowledge and His power? Can you escape Allah's knowledge and His power? Some of the salaf they said, if you want to disobey Allah, then go somewhere where Allah can't see you. Mustahil. If you want to disobey Allah, then go somewhere where Allah can't catch you. If you want to disobey Allah, then go to a place in the earth that doesn't belong to him. And disobey him was something that doesn't belong to him. And so, Shaykh Asari rahimullah ta'ala, he said that this is an oppressive ruling and judgment that they have arrived at. لِتَذَمُونِهِ إِنْ كَارَ قُدْرَةِ اللَّهِ وَحِكْمَتِهِ Because it entails that they deny Allah's power and His wisdom. They deny Allah's power and His wisdom. Allah's wisdom is putting everything in it proper place where it belongs. That is the meaning of wisdom in the Arabic language. Putting everything in its proper place. They deny Allah's power and His wisdom. Meaning that Allah will put them in their proper place. And that He would execute His uh, judgment against them on account of the crimes that they have committed and so on and so forth. Either when the disbelievers reach this conclusion that they could escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they believed or they disbelieved in Allah's power and His wisdom. First and foremost, He said, and they disbelieved, and qudra, or they imagined, rather, or they imagined that they had sufficient power, biha min that they had strength that they could use to protect themselves from Allah's punishment. First response, you know, the hurricane alarms go off, we're going to go into the bunker, right? If everybody else gets swept away, right? The worst of the people, they think they go into the bunker. They think that they can hide in the ground or whatever. Why are you going to run from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They thought that they have some type of strength, some type of power, some type of prowess, some type of ability and he, that they could use to protect them from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُمْ أَضْعَفُوا شَيْءٍ وَأَعْجَزُوا And where they are the weakest of beings and the most helpless of them. What is the connection of this? The further connection, the, the direct connection of this verse to the subject matter of being tested. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he further explains in his tremendous book, Shafa' al-Aliyil. He says, rahimullah ta'ala, he says, may Allah wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. Okay. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes inkar, meaning after, and he mentioning that he tests the people in order to distinguish the truthful from the disingenuous and those that are not dedicated. Then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala makes inkar against those. He says, what Allah is saying here is that He is rejecting the imagination and the suppositions of those who believe that by not adhering to belief and by rejecting following the prophets and the messengers because He is afraid that He will be tried and tested if He does so. He is rejecting that the person by turning away from faith and believing in the messengers is going to be safe from fitna. He is rejecting that this person is going to escape Allah. So Allah is saying, if you think that by not believing in the prophets and the messengers and turning away from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His messengers, thinking that that is the way to get out of fitna, then you're not going to be able to escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is reiterated a little later in the surah, and after a few verses, the person who ja'ala fitnat al-nasi ka'adhaab Allah, the person when he is harmed for the sake of Allah, he makes the harms of the creation comparable to the torment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says something tremendous. And this is one of the most powerful verses in this chapter. One of the most powerful verses in the Quran. مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ لَآتْ وَهُوَ السَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ That whoever hopes for the meeting with Allah, then indeed the appointed meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so shall soon come to pass. It is coming, it is approaching, it is drawing near. It is drawing near. وَهُوَ السَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ And He is the one who hears all and knows all. He is the one who hears all and knows all. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said, inasmuch as that being patient during the frame of time that one is suffering and being afflicted or being tormented for the sake of Allah, harm for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala is tawil. Sabruhu tawil. Being patient during that time, it seems like a very long stretch of time for a person. It seems like a very long stretch of time. فَأَنْفَاسُهُ سَاعَاتِ The passing moments turn into hours. وَسَاعَتُهُ أَيَّامِ And those hours turn to multiple days. person is waiting for relief. He is waiting for the help of Allah. He is waiting to be relieved from a difficulty and a hardship. Most of us in this country, in the, or in the Western world, uh, we don't understand the reality of being tested. Most of us haven't been tested with a bona fide, strong, powerful test concerning our property and our life and so on and so forth. Muslims all over the world are being persecuted and harmed and so on and so forth. And they are tasting the harms of one another, fighting over authority, fighting over wealth, fighting over leadership and the likes of these things. May Allah wa ta'ala return the Muslims back to their glory by returning them back to their religion in a beautiful fashion. And protect us all for fitna and give us al-afu al-afiyah for dunya and akhirah and give us and his pardon and spare us from affliction in this world and the hereafter. He said, but a person finds himself when they are being tested. At that time, seems like a long period of time. The passing moments, every breath, turn into many hours. And those hours, they turn into days, and those days turn into years. And those days turn into months, and those months turn into years. Salla subhanahu wa ta'ala al-mumtahanina fihi. Then Allah wa ta'ala, He says, has given comfort and solace to those who are being tested for His sake and harmed for His sake. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that test has an appointed time, an appointed length of time, and then it's going to stop. And then it's going to stop. And it is what? Inna ajal Allahi la'at. Indeed, the appointed time of Allah, the meeting of Allah, so shun, it's a, it shall soon come to pass. It shall soon come to pass. And so this is a tremendous comfort for the person. And then Allah Taala He sets exactly when that time is going to be. 
when the test is going to stop. When the test is going to stop. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, he was on his deathbed. The scholar, as he mentioned in the biography of Imam Ahmed, and he kept saying, not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet. And they asked him, Ya Aba Abdullah, keep saying, not yet, not yet. And he said, I get waswasa from the shaitan telling me I'm safe from him now. And I keep telling him, not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Not until I die will I be safe from you. Shaitan is trying to make me feel safe. Tell me I'm safe now. Now I'm going to die. I'm safe. Not yet, not yet. So Allah wa ta'ala, and he mentions here, and he gives an exact time so that they can be grateful. وَيَهُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَثْقَالُ وَيُهَوِّنُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَثْقَالَ And so that the weightiness of bearing the brunt of the burden of being tested becomes light for them. فَقَالَ مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجْرَ اللَّهِ لَا آتُ وَهُوَ سَمِيُ الْعَلِيمِ So whoever hopes for the meeting with Allah, then indeed the appointed time of Allah تبارك وتعالى لا آت, it is coming, it is approaching. And he is what? Sami al Alim. Every word in the Quran has a tremendous benefit behind it, has a tremendous meaning behind it. And when Allah concludes a verse with the mention of his beautiful names, then it is perfection upon perfection. He is Sami al Alim and there is a munasiba. There is an applicability, a suitability between these names and the meaning of the verse. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala he explains. One of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said after mentioning that the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing near, it is approaching. And he is the one who hears all and knows all. He says, فَإِذَا تَصَوَّرَ الْعَبْدُ أَجَلَ ذَلِكَ الْبَلَاءَ وَانْقِطَعَهُ وَأَجَلَ لِقَاءِ الْمُبْتَلَى وَأَجَلَ لِقَاءِ الْمُبْتَلِي سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى and it becomes easy for him, therefore, to bear when he realizes that the one who is testing him, he is about to meet the one who has given him this examination. And so when he has to bear difficulty for the sake of Allah, ta'ala, and he realizes, and he realizes that the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be near, and this makes it easy for him. And he is the one who is all hearing and all knowing. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said, I'm looking for him. In general, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said, because that test requires that a person speaks with appropriate statements and behaves appropriately and does what is appropriate. And so Allah has informed that he hears their statements and that he knows what they are doing and what they will do. And so when the person knows that he is being watched by Allah, the one who is examining him subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this makes it easier for him to improve in his condition and to be precise in his actions. Al-Ihsan and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu. Ihsan is that you worship Allah as though you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that anxiousness, as though you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ مَنْ كَانَ يَرُجُ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ Whoever hopes for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shawq, anxiousness. And the person he worships Allah, fleeing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, running towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, racing towards Allah and the good pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What if a person can't do that? فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكِ If the person can't worship Allah with that anxiousness, the cognizance that Allah is described with our perfection and he sees in the universe around him that which reminds him of the knowledge of Allah and the power of Allah and the wisdom of Allah and the mercy of Allah and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty of Allah and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as he reads the book of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and he comes to that cognizance and that realization of the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this person he worships Allah with this shawq, with this anxiousness ka'annahu yarahu he worships Allah though he sees Allah and كَانَ يَرُجُ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ Like the meeting with Allah is about to happen. He worships Allah like that. Whoever hopes for the meeting with Allah, then the meeting with Allah is near. 
Then Allah mentions the other part, which is what? The fact that he watches, the fact that he sees, the fact that he hears, the fact that he knows. This is what will lead a person to worshiping Allah as though Allah sees him. And that he worships Allah with the realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him. He worships Allah as though he sees Allah. If he cannot, then he worships Allah with the cognizance that Allah sees him. The scholars they say, يَفِرُّ مِنْهُ إِلَيْهِ So he flees from Allah. Where is he going? Who is he fleeing to? To Allah. Right? Because in the last verse we heard what? Huh? أَحَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سَيِّئَاتًا يَسْبِقُونَ those people who do sins and evil and so on and so forth, they think they can escape us? He's running from Allah to Allah, tabarakah wa ta'ala. He's running from Allah, tabarakah wa ta'ala, to Allah. So this verse contains within it the both of the sides of Ihsan. Worshipping Allah as though you understand that the meaning of Allah, tabarakah wa ta'ala, can be at any time. A person, his life is not guaranteed, his lifespan is not guaranteed, he doesn't know when he is going to die. A person may die before he reaches his home, before he sees his family again, before his sees his children again. And Allah wa ta'ala give us long lives and righteous deeds. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ طَالَ عُمُرُهُ وَحَسُنَ عَمَلُهُ Any of the best of you are those who have long lives and good deeds. Allah grant us that. And give us al-afu al-afiyah for dunya al-akhirah. But that's a reality. A person is supposed to live every day as though it's his last. SubhanAllah. There was a brother that sits right here or right here in almost every conference, almost every program that we have. And I spoke to him a few months ago, and he just had a very invasive surgery to remove some very dangerous cancerous tumors that have come back in remission a few times over the last 10 years. And he said, while heavily sedated, he said, while heavily sedated, he said, Akhi, subhanallah. When I called the brother, he said, subhanallah, ya akhi. He mentioned that a few of the brothers from the imams and the masajid and the callers, that they had called him to check on him. It was the day after his surgery. And he says, SubhanAllah, I benefited so much from you brothers over the last 10 years. And I found out 10 years ago that I had terminal cancer and that gave me a short period of time that I would live. And so I started to live every day like my last day. I started to live every day like my last day. He said, the kufar, they have bucket list when they are told they're terminally ill. And they go visit their mother, their grandmother, whoever might still be alive, their family members. If they have uh, estranged family members, children, so on and so forth, they try to repair those relationships. All the things they want to do. I want to see Bermuda. I want to see the Caribbean. All these things a person wants to do. And they start doing what? They start living every day like it's their last. He said that Allah testing me with cancer has been Allah's greatest favor upon me in my life. Because I've been living every day like it's my last day. I've been living every day like it's my last day. And alhamdulillah, that's why I'm at every program, at every conference. That's why you always see me. I learned so much from you, brothers. I said, I'm learning a lot from you. It's a tremendous thing. A person would be tested with something like that. A person would be tested with something like that. And I say that that is a favor from Allah to Barak Ta'ala. But think about it. Think about how many people die unexpectedly, quickly. The Salaf, they said there are narrations from the, from the Sahaba. That they said in Motul Fuja'a, and that uh, sudden death, unexpected death, is Ra'afatun al Mu'min, or Asafun al Fajr, or Fi Riwatin al Kafir. An unexpected death is either Allah's kindness to a believer or Allah's wrath against a wicked person. Allah seizes a person unexpectedly, they didn't think they were going to die. It is either His kindness towards that person or His wrath upon that person. Has to be Allah. The meeting with Allah is something that is near. A person is supposed to live every day. As so of the meeting with Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, is something very near. And if he's not living like that, وَهُوَ سَمِيُّ الْعَلِيمِ إِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يراك. He doesn't reach, reach that worship of the level of worship. Worshipping Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, with that type of anxiousness. Then he knows that Allah is watching him. If he wants to improve his situation, then he reminds himself of this. يعني يا أيها المحب لربه المشتاق لقربه ولقائه المسارع في مرضاته أبشر بقرب لقاء الحبيب السعدي said oh you who loves his lord who is anxious 
to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to raise to that which is pleasing to Allah. Abshir bi qurbi liqa al habib. Receive glad tidings of the near, the nearness of the meeting of the one that you love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa innahu at. Because it's coming. Wa kullu atin innama huwa qareeb. And everything that is coming is coming very soon. Fatazawwa li liqaihi. So prepare to meet him. Wasir nahwa. And journey towards him. Mustashiban al raja. Accompanying al raja. And he having hope, tremendous hope in Allah's mercy. Always accompanying you. Expecting that you are going to arrive soon to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Walakin, ma kullu man yadda'i yu'ta bi da'wah. He said, however, not everyone who makes a claim is given what they claim. Wala kullu man tamanna yu'ta ma tamanna. And not everyone who has a hope or a wish receives that which they have wishful thinking about. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ السَّمِيعُ لِلْأَصْوَاتِ For verily Allah, He hears all sounds, all noises, every word that is uttered. عَلِيمٌ بِالنِّيَاتِ And He knows our intentions. فَمَنْ كَانَ صَادِقًا فِي ذَلِكَ أَنَا لَهُ مَا يَرْجُ وَمَنْ كَانَ كَاذِبًا لَمْ تَنْفَعَهُ دَعْوَاهُ So the person who is genuine, and wanting to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that genuineness and that hope will cause him to reach all that he ever wanted. And the person who is disingenuous will not be benefited by his claim that he wants to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ الْعَلِيمُ بِمَنْ يَصْلُحْ لِحُبِّهِ وَمَنْ لَا يَصْلُحْ And he is alim, he is all-knowing, meaning pertaining those that are appropriate to receive his love, for him to love them, and those that are inappropriate. وَمَنْ جَاهَدْ نَفْسَهُ وَشَيْطَانَ وَعَدُوَّهُ الْكَافِرُ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ And the person who struggles, and he only struggles to benefit his own self, لِأَنَّ نَفْعُهُ رَاجِعٌ إِلَيْهِ وَثَمْرَتُهُ عَائِدَةٌ إِلَيْهِ Because the benefit of it is reciprocated to him, and the fruit of it returns back to him. وَاللَّهُ غَانِيٌ عَنَ الْعَالَمِينَ And Allah is free of needing the alameen. And Allah is free of needing all of mankind. لَمْ يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِمَا أَمَرُهُمْ بِهِ لِيَنْتَفِعَ بِهِ He didn't order him, man, with that which he ordered him with, in order to benefit by his obedience. وَلَا نَهَاهُمْ عَمَا نَهَاهُمْ عَنْ بُخْلًا عَلَيْهِمْ And he didn't forbid him from what he forbade him from, out of stinginess because he doesn't want him to have some things that are really good for him. But rather Allah, he ordered us with what he ordered us with, out of a mercy for us, and forbade us from what he forbade us from, out of a mercy for us. سبحانه وتعالى وقد عَلِيمَا أَنَا الْأَوَامِرْ وَالنَّوَاهِ وَقَدْ عُلِيمَا أَنَا الْأَوَامِرْ وَالنَّوَاهِ يَحْتَاجَ الْمُكَلَّفُ فِيهَا إِلَى جِهَادٍ لِأَنَّ النَّفْسَهُ تَتَثَاقَلْ لِطَبْعِهَا عَنَ الْخَيْرِ And it is known that the orders and the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause or they require from the person who is responsible for them that he struggles and he strives and he makes an effort لِأَنَّ النَّفْسَهُ تَتَثَاقَلْ لِطَبْعِهَا عَنَ الْخَيْرِ Look at the two things that Ibn Uqayyim mentions are the reality of Sirq. He has a tremendous book that is called the letter of Ibn Uqayyim to one of his brothers. And he said that Sirq is found in two things. It is found in two things. The first is Adam al-Tifat ila ma siwa matlubik. That a person is not distracted by anything except his objective, which is to arrive safely at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is what? Which is what we just heard. You're going to go through difficulties, you're going to go through hardships, but the comfort is what? That you're going to meet Allah, so don't think about the adversity, don't think about the suffering, don't think about the pain. Know that the meeting with Allah is very soon. The meeting with Allah is very near. He's not distracted by anything else. He focuses. He focuses. And the second thing Ibn Uqayya mentioned is and he badlul juhd, that he gives his best effort in what he is doing. He is focused. He is focused and fulfilling the rights of Allah, the rights of the creation, the rights of his wife, the rights of his children. As we said, living every day like it's his last. Living every day like it's his last. He is laser focused. He is focused upon the objective. He's not distracted by anything that will take him away from his focus. And he gives his best effort. And he gives his best effort. 
he said this as regards the salah and as regards everything outside of the salah and he in the salah think about the salah of a person who was distracted a person who was a sadiq he's looking to his left he's looking to his right he's looking up perhaps Allah may snatch his eyesight from him by looking up while he prays as is threatened on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ for the person who looks up while he prays and a person who beats the Imam to a position Allah wa ta'ala is threatened by the Messenger وسلم, and that Allah wa ta'ala may change his face to the face of a donkey and there was a scholar that used to narrate a hadith and he used to wear something over his face and when he would narrate he would only narrate from behind the curtain and on one day they removed the curtain some of the scholars of hadith reported one day they removed the curtain and they saw he had the face of a donkey and he said what happened to you and he quoted the hadith from the Prophet ﷺ and he said one day I beat the Imam and this is what happened to me one day I was racing with the Imam and this is what happened to me the person he's distracted in the salat he's not focusing think about the salat of this person compared to the person who he understands that the salat is a meeting between him and Allah and according to how well he does in this meeting will be how well he does in the eventual meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a preparation for him for the eventual meeting with Allah that could come at any time. Think about the person who has that type of focus as opposed to the person who's mindless in the salat, not focused in the salat. Thinking about all those things that he can't take with him into his grave. And the person who doesn't give any effort in his salat. These are the two things that Ibn Qayyim says they are the reality of a sidq. That he's not distracted. He's not distracted. He's focused on what he is doing. And secondly, he gives his best effort. And so Allah wa ta'ala, He has mentioned that which would take the focus of the person off of the adversity by mentioning that the meeting with Allah is near. And he said, وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِ And whoever struggles and he struggles to benefit his own self. These are the details of sidq. These are the details of what it means to pass a person's test. Whoever struggles and he struggles to benefit his own self. Inna Allah, indeed Allah, la ghaniyun an al-alameen. Indeed Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, without a doubt, is free of need of the alameen. Then he said, tabarak wa ta'ala, وَلَذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ لَنُكَفِّرَنَّ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَلَا نَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَحْسَنَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And those that believe and do righteous deeds, then we will expiate their sins from them, and we will reward them according to the best of what they used to do. And we reward them according to the best of what they used to do. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he says in his explanation of this surah, ثُمَّ لَمَّ كَانَ الْمُمْتَحَنُ لَبُدَّ أَنْ يَنْحَرِفْ عَنْ تَرِيقُ الصَّبْرِ وَالْمُجَاهَدَةِ لِدَوَاعِ طَبِيعَتِهِ وَهَوَاهُ وَضَعْفِهِ عَنْ مُقَاوَمَةِ مَبْتُلِيَ بِهِ And then inasmuch as that it is unavoidable for the person while he is being tested by Allah, that sometimes he would deviate away from patience. And sometimes he would deviate away from having the proper level of struggle. And he sometimes his patience is weak. And sometimes his struggle is not at the level of effort that it should be. Then Allah wa ta'ala, on account of this person having human nature, on account of this person having impulses and weaknesses, Allah wa ta'ala, he mentions, and he promises subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yatajawaza lahu, and tharika wa anhu. That the person, meaning who's given a good effort, who's focused, who's sincere, so on and so forth, trying his best to be upon the truth. That Allah wa ta'ala, concerning any his shortcomings and his efforts, that Allah what? That Allah will expiate his sins for him. Allah will expiate his sins for him, and he will reward him according to the best of what he used to do, not the worst of what he used to do. That Allah wa ta'ala reward him for the best of what he used to do. And then Allah wa ta'ala, he mentions, out of all the examples that he could mention, and this is where we'll continue tomorrow, bi idnillah, out of all the examples that he can mention, in these first 12 verses, that are the opening verses of Surah Al-Ankabut, that explain to us the reality of being tested by Allah wa ta'ala. Out of all the examples that he could have mentioned, of how a person is tested, he mentioned, how a person is tested, he mentioned one of the most trying and difficult of tests. He said, وَوَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عَلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا And we ordered mankind with good treatment, kind treatment of his parents. 
and if they struggle against you, so that you make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with that which you have no knowledge of, and no one has knowledge that there is authority of shirk, because there is no evidence for it. فَلَا تُطْعِحُمَا That's a tremendous test. That a person enters into Islam, and his parents and his family members remain upon disbelief. And they struggle to call him to the fire. As a believer from Ali Fir'aun, he said, يَا قَوْمِ مَا لِي أَدْعُوكُمْ إِلَى النَّجَاتِ وَتَدْعُونَنِي إِلَى النَّارِ تَدْعُونَنِي لِأَكْفُرَ بِاللَّهِ وَأُشْرِكَ بِهِ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِهِ عِلْمِ وَأَنَا أَدْعُوكُمْ إِلَى الْعَزِيزِ الْغَفَّارِ O oh my people, why is it that I am calling you to salvation, you're calling me to hell? I'm calling you, تَدْعُونَنِي You are calling me to making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that which I have no knowledge of there being evidence for because there's no evidence for it. Why I am calling you to the one who was mighty and forgiving. Tabarak wa ta'ala. This is a tremendous test and this is where we'll continue tomorrow. We ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to open up the hearts of our, our disbelieving parents if we have disbelieving parents and our disbelieving family members. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa tabarak wa asma'u. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he to ease the struggles that we go through in this life and to give us as the Prophet sallallahu asked for يعني وأسألك من اليقين ما يحوّن علينا مصائب الدنيا Oh Allah, I ask you for certainty to a degree that will lighten and alleviate the hardships of this world We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala في العافو في العافية في الدنيا والآخرة And we ask Allah تبارك wa ta'ala يقين عذاب يوم يبعث عباده to protect us from his punishment the day that he resurrects his servants. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.